Welcome to Future Talk. We've got a great topic today, the human mind. It's one of the most important areas in all of science, but also one of the most difficult to study. I have two guests from the field of neuroscience who are going to share their insights. Michael Merzenich is a professor emeritus of neuroscience at the University of California at San Francisco. He's won many awards and honors for his work and is especially well known for his work with brain plasticity, meaning the ability of the brain to adapt itself physically when the need arises. Simon Tan is a clinical psychologist and neuropsychologist at Stanford Medical Center, where he specializes in the diagnosis of developmental, psychiatric, and neurologic disorders. He also maintains a private practice in neuropsychology. We'll be discussing the latest advances in neuroscience, how learning and cognition work, common impairments of the mind, and also the untapped potentials of the mind. Gentlemen, welcome to the program. Nice to be with you, Mike. Thank you very much. Michael, let me start by asking you this. Is there a difference between brain and mind? Are they synonymous or are they different concepts? So when we see the brain operating in thought, and one of the fabulous things about contemporary science is we can actually witness the brain in operation in thought or in the control of action or in the re reception of information from the world. We see no real distinction in the machinery that's engaged, and we see no real distinction in the operations of the machine that's engaged in these different levels of operation. So when you're solving a problem, when you're thinking through your ideas, when you're, when you're of course, different, the machinery is engaged in different ways, in different proportionalities, you could say, but the actual physical machine is essentially the same. So we see the operations in a sense of the, what you would call the mind coming out of the operations of the physical brain. Can we draw a parallel with computers, for example, and say that the physical brain represents the hardware and the mind represents the software, the thing that drives the hardware? Well, that's not really, I think, a, a correct distinction because when we see the physical brain in operation, we, we, of course, we see the information flowing across the machine like the information would flow across the, the computer. In that sense, you could say that it's like the activity that's flowing across the computer. The difference, though, between the brain and a computer is that the brain is biological. It's not a fixed, permanent structure. It's actually revisable in a life, and it's actually being continually revised in life. So it's not like the computer, not hardbound, not hardwired like the computer on your, your desk. I like to say it's softwired. Now, is that the concept of plasticity that you've worked on, where the brain can create new neurons and new connections? Actually, absolutely. That's exactly what it does. Each time you improve at any ability, or each time you acquire a new skill or ability, the brain is actually revising itself. It's actually changing its wiring and its func functionality, its physicality, in ways that account for the improvement of the skill or the development of a new skill. Now, what's the most important question that you're trying to find the answer to in your study of the brain? Well, I'm interested in plasticity as it contributes to the origins of human behavior and as it accounts for the incredibly wonderful expression of individuation and behavior. We're all different because our brains have all evolved in an absolutely idiosyncratic way. Every human being is different in the physical brain they carry around within them because it's plastic and its actual functionality is based on billions of events of change. But I'm also interested in marshalling this science to try to drive change in brains that are struggling or straggling, you could say. People that are suffering in life are people that are, that are, that are, uh, that are struggling in life because of problems that come from, the, from neurology that's distorted or dysfunctional. And that, that applies to, to, to about half of us at some time in our life, in our human existence. Now, would this be a physical problem with the brain? You know, the brain is pretty well protected. It's inside the skull. There's not too much harm that can come to it. So what, what would go wrong with the brain? Well, even in intact brains, there's all kinds of things that go wrong. The brain has failure modes because it's organizing its own activities and they account for our functional operations, it actually can drive itself into a ditch, you could say, in a lot of ways. And we, we have grand names for these conditions. We might call them bipolar disorder or schizophrenia or depression or, or obsessive compulsive disorder or ADHD or, or, or hundreds of other labels that we put on these things. And in fact, in every one of these instances, the brain basically has been driven in a distorting direction. And we can look at the brain functionally and physically and see that it is driven plastically in a distorted direction, in an in a abnormal position. And one of the things we're trying to do in our science is to actually marshal the forces of 
brain plasticity to drive it back correctively because we have this power to change. Can how much can we change it correctively to drive the brain back as far as possible in a renormalizing direction? Now, how would you change your brain? Would it be through the conscious process where you tell a person you need to start thinking this way? That's our primary strategy is to train the brain intensively. And we understand the rules of plasticity. We understand the rules that govern change in a normal life. And using modern technology, we can actually bring those plasticity processes under control and with high efficiency, drive brains in many dimensions in corrective or strengthening or recovering directions. Now, sometimes as people age, they develop brain problems like Alzheimer's, for example. Right. Is that something that's on your radar for possibly fixing, finding out why it happens and making sure it doesn't? Once the illness arises, it's very difficult to repair the brain because a lot of bombs have gone off a little. The pathology itself is mass, can be massively destructive, but the brain actually in its powers, can, can, a lot of things can be done to increase resilience, that basically put the brain in a safer position. So one of our fundamental research efforts is directed towards trying to increase that safety so that people live longer lives, you could say, that before the emergence of Alzheimer's disease and potentially prevent its onset uh, in, the, in, in almost everybody to the end of life. Now, how do you study the brain? I assume that you can learn more by studying live brains than studying dead brains, and you put electrodes on a person's skull and watch the reactions? Well, we have wonderful recording and imaging strategies in which we can actually look in the brain while the brain is in action. And we can see the brain and, and actually record its responses as you're responding, as you're making decisions, as you're in complex operations in controlling your actions or controlling your thoughts. Mm -hmm. And we can see that we can define not just normal actions, normal reactivity, normal patterns of connection, nor, nor, normal patterns of operation, normal phys physical brain, but we can also see all kinds of ways that a brain that's struggling can be distorted or is distorted. And that gives us a blueprint about how we might think about correcting such a problem in, an, in a living individual. And we can actually do this in an individuated way. We could look in your brain, define your strengths, in a sense record your weaknesses, and use that as a strategy if you're struggling especially to try to drive corrections to help you. Can you learn much about a brain just by looking at the brain if you don't know the individual in advance? Oh, a lot. A lot, because you can drive the brain in the domain of functional assessment. And when you can look at your, your, the capacities of the operation of your brain as you are being, in a sense, assessed or evaluated in your performance. We commonly use strategies in which we're measuring your beha behavioral performance abilities, of course. But we actually can learn an awful lot about your operational powers mm -hmm. by looking at the physical and functional brain, about how your brain is operating itself, your brain in front of us. We can tell a lot about you, Marty. Well, that's good to know. We won't tell anybody <laughs> else. <so. Okay. laughs> now, Simon, let me ask you a question. Because you're a clinical neuropsychologist, you deal with patients. Right. Uh, what are some of the common problems that people come to you with? 